Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. Well, um, before we left, I guess last week you guys met in the park, Liz and I were gone, um, but uh, we, we jumped into the book of Ruth. And um, we're going to go through that book uh, in, I think, five or six weeks. I don't remember, Aiden. Do you remember? Five weeks. Okay. And um, Evan kind of did a great setup of kind of what is this book about? How is it written? Uh, what are some of the spiritual themes in it? And he took us through the first five verses. Um, this morning, we're going to do the rest of chapter one. But um, we don't usually do this, but I got to back up and start in, in verse 1 and go through verse 22. And the reason being is um, it's just all part of the story. And what I'd like to have us do this morning is, um, is really look at what I would consider the gritty reality that Naomi and her family was experiencing. Because I think a lot of times, at least I catch myself doing it. I'll peruse through scripture and try to pull out these spiritual truths that like, oh, these are the high points. And I miss the grittiness of what's actually happening in those people's lives. And the reason I think that that's important that we wrestle with that is because that's actually where faith is played out. Faith is not played out up here in a spiritual realm. Faith is played out in the grittiness of real life. And so um, I wanted us just to take some time this morning. Chapter one is a great setup for the rest of this, this uh, book. But to wrestle with, and I'm gonna focus primarily on Naomi. We'll talk a little bit about Ruth also, but just, mm, what was it like? So, um, let's go ahead and jump in uh, to chapter one and uh, we'll just, uh, we'll read starting at the very, very beginning. So it says here, during the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. A man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. His name was Elim <laughs> Elimelech, Give me some grace on some of these names. His wife's name was Naomi, got that one. His two sons were Malin and Kilian. They were uh, uh, Ephrathites from Jerusalem and Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Okay, so I want to start with just, again, I want to take a quick look at Naomi. Um... And this is before the famine, okay? So Naomi is uh, living in Bethlehem. And Naomi is living a life that I think by all terms of that time is a blessed, gifted life. Because she has a husband who we find out a little later has land and she has given birth to two sons. Now, um, that means for her, the family name and heritage will continue and she has security and honor. She is living a blessed life. And I think sometimes for us in our world, we don't understand the significance of this. But if we look throughout scripture, one of the things we see 
is the pain expressed from women who have been unable to bear children. And then the utter celebration and thankfulness when God answers their prayers with a son. I mean, so we look through, we see Abraham's wife, Sarah. We see Isaac's wife, Rebecca. Same story. Jacob's wife, Rachel. I mean, Rachel literally says after, after she finally has a son, God has taken away my disgrace. That's how deep this runs in this culture. We have Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And it's interesting, um, I'd encourage you to go read the, the first chapter, and it may even be the first two chapters of Samuel where uh, she, she talks about her wrestle with God on this. But she literally goes and cries out to God and said, God, I, I want to bear a child. I want a son. And as she's doing this, Eli, the priest, thinks she's drunk because she's just, she's, her, she's crying out with her heart. And, she, and Eli asked her, why, why did you come to the temple drunk? And, and she says, no, my Lord. Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before God. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Resentment. I mean, this, this was how deep this ran in the culture. But Naomi had been blessed. I mean, Naomi is truly thriving. She is thriving. But then, then the first, uh, the first hit to this blessing and security comes. And it comes in, in the way of a famine. Now again, you know, the first time I read through the scripture, and there was a famine, they moved the land, you know. And I thought, oh, wait a second. What's famine look like? What does it look like? I mean, we've seen pictures of famine in Africa. They're brutal pictures. In our own country, you can go back to pictures from the 1930s during the Dust Bowl, and you see people literally picking up, packing everything they have onto one vehicle and leaving because they don't think they can survive anymore. They have to go. I mean, what, what picture comes to your mind when you think of famine? Honestly, some other pictures that came to my mind as I was thinking about it was, quite honestly, our southern border. And some of the stories I've heard of people pouring across our southern border. Pictures of Gaza that came up in my head of people moving. And again, these aren't political statements. These are just observations of the intense pain and suffering that exists in our world today. This is all still prevalent. I mean, can you imagine the trauma of that move, that one line? Naomi has to leave. She's going to leave with her husband and her two boys, but she has to leave her people, her culture, and she has to go to a land of a former enemy just, just to try to survive, okay? But then the second blow comes, and the second blow not only affects her blessing and her security, it affects her relational world. It says in the scripture, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died and she was left with two sons. The person that she has moved to this new land with has died. He was her support system. So we have the security, but then just the relational pain of that occurring. 
But then, but then something good happens. It says, her sons took Moabite women as their wives, one named Orpah and the other was named, and the second was named Ruth. Now, re-enter a little bit of stability for her. She's still a widow, but she's at least a widow with family. The care and support structure has kind of grown around her again. But this too ends sooner than she would have expected. And both of her sons die. Scripture says, after they lived in Moab, for about 10 years, both Malin and Killian also died. And the woman, Naomi, was left without her two children and her husband. In a matter of 10 years, Naomi has gone from blessed, safe, and secure to now basically living in the margins in a remote land. She's moved from honored and blessed to insignificant and unseen. Naomi now identifies with two groups of people that we see mentioned time and time and time again in the Old Testament. She now identifies with the widow and the alien. And we see God time and time and time again say, listen, what matters is how you care for the widow, the orphan, and the alien. Because those are the people with no power. Those are the unseen. Those are the ones that are living without a protected system of safety around them. And we also see God literally judge his people because of the fact that they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't take care of the orphan and the widow and the alien. They were overlooking them. So this is where Naomi finds herself. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you relate to that? Honestly, has that happened to you? To move from seen to unseen. From blessed into the margins. Well, let's pick up the story from there. So, she and her daughter-in-laws set out to return from the territory of Moab because she had heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. Remember that phrase. She left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughter-in-laws, and traveled along the road leading back to Judah. So Naomi has decided, I have to go back. If I'm going to survive, I have to go back and at least hope that my people will take care of me because we are now three widows with no kids and no husband. And um, as she's going back though, something strikes Naomi. The three of them are on the road and they're going back. And suddenly Naomi has this realization. You know what? My daughter-in-laws, they still have a shot at a normal life. There's a chance that they could go back to their people. They could find new husbands. They could re-engage in a system of security and blessing. if they go back. And so basically, Naomi has to make a decision. 
And what she decides is that I want the best for my daughter-in-laws regardless of the cost to me. It's going to cost her everything. Literally, she is going to be alone. But this is what she chooses because she, she loves her daughter-in-laws and she wants the best for them. And scripture says, Naomi said to them, each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each one of you rest in the house of a new husband. She kissed them and they wept loudly. They said to her, we insist on returning with you to your people. I want to stop there for just a second. Because when I, when I look at this, I, I feel like it, we're getting a glimpse of Naomi's character in this. What's clear is there is a deep bond of love that exists between her daughter-in-laws and her. She has obviously loved well because they can't imagine going on without her. They can't imagine sending her off by herself. But we also see in Naomi, I think, the strength that has been formed in her through all of these experiences she's gone through. Because she's like, I'm not going to take no for an answer. And I think we also see some wisdom in her because she's like, okay, I have to change my tact here. So you see her move from the emotional ties, uh, the relational ties have created some strong emotions, so she shifts gears and she moves to a very, um, oh, what's the word I want to say? A, ver a, a rational, a very rational argument in an attempt to play to the rational side of their brains and push past the emotional pushback that they're giving her. So, she says this, but Naomi replied, return home, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Am I able to have any more sons that, you could, that could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Go on, for I am too old to have another husband. And even if I thought I was, there was still hope for me to have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourselves from remarrying? No, my daughters, my life is much too bitter for you to share because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Again, they wept loudly and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. She has really tried to convince them, it's in your best interest. Go back. You have a shot at a life. But Ruth replied, don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely. If anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. Now, I don't think she means she gave her the silent treatment. She just stopped trying to convince her. So, Orpah eventually concedes to Ruth's logic, or I'm sorry, to Naomi's logic. 
But Ruth, on the other hand, refuses. Now, a uh, bit of a side note here. It's so interesting when we sit with Scripture and wrestle with Scripture how sometimes God will bring things to mind about us that we may not have fully caught or grasped or at least understood the depth of it. And um, for me, one morning I was, I was sitting in my chair and I'm thinking about this scripture and I don't know how many times, but at this point I'd read Ruth, <laughs> the first chapter of Ruth. But all of a sudden God's like, Craig, I sense you wanting to judge Orpah. Why are you trying to judge Orpah? Why? Is there a need to judge here? You know, Orpah's decision, uh, we see in that decision both rational thinking and quite honestly, obedience. Obedience to her mother-in-law. It's not a bad decision. Could even be argued that it was a very good decision. They may have both made the right decision. We don't even know the rest of Orpah's story. And as I was sitting there, it just was super sobering. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this. But it was super sobering that I was attempting to make one sister-in-law good and one sister-in-law bad. This isn't an account of good and bad. This is an account about God at work in the midst of a very broken and fallen and sinful world. Yet I wanted to make it more than that. And it just struck me. I'm like, whoo, pray. Why? Why do you feel the need to judge in this circumstance? And let's face it, our society promotes what? Judging and separating. So what's in my heart gets fueled daily unless I find a different way to fuel my heart. Back to the story. Um, but as we see in the story, Ruth's answer to Naomi is absolutely not. You know, she said, where you go, I go. Where you live, I live. Your God will be my God, which, as I thought about it, that's a bit of a quandary for me. Um, and we're, we'll talk more about that in a second. I will die where you die and be buried where you are buried. Here we see in Ruth a second account of irrational other-centeredness. The first one was Naomi. It would have been better for Naomi to keep the, the little group together, but Naomi's like, nope. Nope. I will sacrifice for the sake of others. And now we see it again in Ruth. I will sacrifice for the sake of someone else. And it's super interesting to me that if you look through the lineage of Jesus, you see two things kind of jump out at you if you look at all of the different characters. One is a common trait of faithful obedience. And the other one is a, is a radical other-centeredness that shows up time and time again. And then, of course, we fast forward to Jesus, and he comes to earth, and what does he teach? Faithful obedience and radical other-centeredness. Radical other-centeredness. 
We see it in when he's talking, giving the story of judging the sheep from the goats. The sheep are these people that fed me and clothed me, and they're like, wait, 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 when did, when did we do that? When I was in prison, when I was poor. There's just this, this radical sense, of course, then Jesus fully demonstrates that on the cross. But there's something to this radical sense of un- other-centeredness that God truly, truly honors. So the account of their lives continues. The two of them traveled until they came to Bethlehem. When they entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about their arrival. And the local women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Remember, she left at least 10 years ago now. We don't know what the travel times are, but scripture tells us at least 10 years. And Naomi's reply is this. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Now, the significance of that is the name Naomi means gentle. Mara means bitter. She answered, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has opposed me and the Almighty has afflicted me. That's some brutal honesty. That's some brutal honesty about how her life has looked. And it's brutal honesty with with people and with God. Which is what draws me back to that quandary I mentioned a couple minutes ago. So you have this, you have Ruth, and Ruth's like, my God, or your God will be my God. I'm like, well, well what, what, would, what would make you want to choose a God that you perceive has done this to your mother-in-law? It's a bit of a mystery there. And I think the more I looked at, looked at scripture and thought about it, I'm like, I think this is because God is truly at the center of Naomi's thinking in life. It's, it's just reality for Naomi. God is God. That's a reality for her. And it's a reality whether or, whether or not she's being blessed or afflicted that doesn't change who God is to her. God is at the center of everything. And I think that's true because if you look back to that scripture at the very beginning, I said pay attention to this phrase. She says be, uh, early on when they decide to go back to Moab, she says because she had heard in Moab, so while she's in Moab, that the Lord had paid attention to the people's need by providing food. In her mind, God had done that. They had need and God had provided. And I think it's that centrality of God that Naomi had that um, Ruth was just constantly exposed to. Ruth knew that Naomi loved her deeply. And so she was kind of like, if he's your God, he'll be my God. You love me deeply. Everything that you do, God's at the center. He will now be the center for me too. I'm going to adopt that. Because how could I not 
when someone loves me this deeply that they were willing to give me up so that I could thrive. It was funny, Liz and I were talking about this and um, we were reminded of Liz's aunt, uh, Aunt Shake. Aunt Shake was born and raised in Lebanon, in Beirut. And one of the things about Aunt Shake was um, God was just kind of like at the center. It was a given. It wasn't some gigantic you know, explanation. It was just a given. And one of the things that Aunt Chake would say is anytime she talked about the future, like, you know, next week we're going to, uh, we're going to run up to Wisconsin and spend the day in Madison. And that would always be followed with God willing. God willing. Because God's at the center. My life operates around it. I think this is who Naomi was. So, we jump back to the scripture, and it says, So Naomi came back from the territory of Moab with her daughter-in-law Ruth, the Moabitess. Possibly said that way. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Great foreshadowing. <laughs> of what is still to come. But my hope this morning is just that as we look at Naomi's life, we don't just see it as a Bible story with a biblical truth. This was a real life that she lived. And it was a hard life. But she left God in the center in the good times and in the bad. God was in the center. Let's pray.